Have you seen me dice bag? <laughs> Rognard Files. Hello, my name is Dirk the Dice, and this is the Grognard Files podcast, talking bobbins about tabletop RPGs from back in the day and today. This is an unusual episode as it was recorded live at Grogmeet in 2018. It features an interview with Ian Cooper, the line editor of HeroQuest at Chaosium. HeroQuest is one of those new fandangled games that was first launched nearly 20 years ago. We've had a new review on the iTunes from Stimbot5000, who attended Grogmeet, our annual get-together in Manchester, for the first time. Warm and thoughtful and loving Grognadia. I've been listening to the files for a year or two now. A pair of softly spoken middle-aged Merlion fans discuss old favourites and some newer pretenders from the tabletop RPG world with the help of some friends. It's like wearing your favourite old warm jumper and drinking a cup of cocoa whilst flicking through your old, well-loved and used games from back in the day. It's wonderful. These same fellows host Grogmeat, which I attended for the first time last month. The best and only RPG meetup. I've ever attended. Thanks, Stimbot. When I first started the podcast, I researched the history of RuneQuest to understand what had happened to the setting of Glorantha when I stopped playing in 1988. I recognised HeroQuest not only because of the board game with the same name, but because it was mentioned as a forthcoming supplement and back of the original RuneQuest rules. I immediately downloaded the core rulebook and started to read it. And I must admit, I couldn't make head and a tail of it. Since I'd stopped playing RPGs, I'd missed several paradigm shifts. It was clear that if I wanted to understand HeroQuest, I'd need to learn a whole new lexicon, as well as change my style of play. I continued to explore some of the other HeroQuest supplements from Moon Design, the Sartar Companion, a supplement that was also mentioned at the back of the original RuneQuest rules and I translated it into a RuneQuest campaign. John Hancock, friend and contributor to the GrogPod, recommended that the best way into HeroQuest is to actually play it, as it's a game to be experienced rather than read. At UK Games Expo, I played in a game with Ian Cooper as the Games Master, and I was instantly bought into the idea and how the characters worked, how the mechanics took us through the story of the adventure and the scalability, how contests can be huge or minute depending on the situation and the choices of the players around the table. In this interview, Ian talks about his formative years in gaming and how he was drawn towards the mechanics of HeroQuest to play the kinds of games he wanted to play. He explains the rules in detail and how oral storytelling techniques can be used to enhance GM skills. He also talks about his coming storm campaign, set in Glorantha's Dragon Pass. Grogmeat coincided with the memorial weekend for Greg Stafford. Ian shares his experiences of working with Greg and socialising with him. We are all us. After the interview, I'm joined by Blythe in the room of role-playing rambling to reflect on some of the generic systems that we've been exploring. Over the next year, we're looking at some of the influences on our gaming back in the day and how it's possible with modern gaming mechanics to emulate them. Would you like to win your own copy of HeroQuest Glorantha? Well, listen at the end to a new competition hosted by long-standing members of the Grog Squad and supporters of the Grog Pod, bonamigames.uk the home of Convivial Gaming, a great small online gaming store with specially curated content. They've donated a copy of the rules and Joe and Chris will be judging a competition. Also at the end, I'll be thanking new patrons and telling you about what we've got planned next. It's a big one this, so make a brew and take your time. Ramblers, let's get rambling. Hello, my name is Dirk the Dice and this is the Grognard Files podcast. 
talking bobbins about tabletop RPGs from back in the day and today. I'm go- coming live from Grogmeat in Fanboy 3 in Manchester. Uh, according to Tabletop Gaming Magazine, Grogmeat is the UK's favourite Manchurian convention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm completely and utterly surrounded by the Grog Squad. Yay! On my right is mythologist, games designer, line editor of Hero Quest for RPG for uh, KSEM, and dot .net guru, whatever one of those is, Ian Cooper. Good Hello, morning. Ian. Good morning. <laughs> On my left is a ridiculous homemade shrine to the actress, Caroline Munro. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, obviously it's a portable version. Uh, it would be ridiculous to bring the full thing. That would be that would be strange. Would you like to give it a tap? Oh, look! I can touch the face. Look! Wow. <laughs> okay. Oh, give, I... it, give it a tap. Okay. Let's see what. Oh, it's, oh. Uh, it's oh. Margiana. <laughs> Margiana from uh, the Golden Voyage Sinbad. I love it when Margiana pops out. No, I know. I know, Ian, yeah, you're a fan of uh, Harry Harryhausen movies. I am, yeah. 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 I, what, yeah. What, what is it about them? I, I think that the, the stop-motion animation really adds to actually some of the um, effects, particularly the skeletons um, from um, Jason. Uh, yeah. those, those skeletons work better as stop-motion than they ever would as CGI. Yeah. And there's something about the way that he... Uh, they, they used uh, different myth- mythologies as well, isn't it? Which is relevant to what we're talking about, because of course the Kraken appears in ancient Greece. Yeah, and you know, um, uh, Harryhausen's kind of uh, work is actually pretty much the same sort of influences that Grantham has taken. Yeah. Um, I think particularly people like Sandy Peterson and their involvement in Grantham, I'm sure he brought a lot of uh, uh, Harryhausen stuff into his version of Grantham. Yeah. So this is uh, the first time that we've done a live recording. And we're going to do something special. Okay. We're going to do a mashup of all the Grognard Files uh, sections under one roof. It's a one-stop shop of Grognard Files. I, 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 I don't know. I know. Brace yourselves. <laughs> so that that's a bit of a starburst memory, isn't it? That? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So let's do this. Open box. So open box is part of the show where we look backwards to look forwards to reflect on where we've come from as gamers and where we're going. So, this is a question we always ask Ian. Mm-hmm. What was the first game you played and uh, who did you play it with? Now, interestingly, the, the first game I sort of played in role playing, in my role playing history, was Traveller. So, we played in the extent that we generated characters. We went through, as you know, Traveller character generation. You live your entire life, you die if you're a scout. Um, and we rolled up a number of characters. That was very exciting. We were all very excited about this Traveller game we were going to play. The trouble was the, the referee, in Traveller terms, couldn't really work out what we were supposed to actually do. So we played Dungeons and Dragons instead. Right. Yeah. Because we could just go down a dungeon and that was a lot easier. So yeah. Traveller is technically the first game I played, but then I guess my actual playing history really started with Dungeons and Dragons, like most people's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And which, uh, which version of uh, D&D was it that you were playing? Uh, A&D, yeah. because um, I looked down on basic D&D, because it was basic. Why, <laughs> why would I want to play the basic game when I could play the advanced game? Yeah, of course. These okay. things are very important when you're about 11. Yeah. And so what time was this? What, 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 uh, what year did you So, wow, that's, uh, it must have been about um, 78, 79. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and we'd have, so there was a war games club at school, and I really, originally I got into the war games club, and we would, you know, refight, or well not refight, we would fight battles between Soviet and, you know, uh, Allied tanks on large tables in the school holidays. And then, um, I can't even remember his name, that's shameful, isn't it? Uh, someone turned up basically with Traveller, and it was like, here are role playing games. And of course, yeah. it was about the time, just post Star Wars, we were all very excited. Traveller was like, yeah. held his promise for us that we could be Han Solo or whatever. Um, but at the same time, I'd also uh, just, re- I know I was always a very bad as a kid at uh, wanting to read a book. Really just found most of the books I was given too dull. My mother effectively had regularly tried to get me to read The Secret Garden, but it seemed that I just wasn't <laughs> interested. Uh, and uh, The Hobbit 
Can I change that for me? We're doing The Hobbit at school, we're reading it as a school book, and I just devoured the whole thing, you know. And never before have my parents seen me actually, not, not you know, rather than saying to me, you must read the chapter of the book tonight, I, I devoured the whole thing. And then I was thinking, oh, well, you know, wouldn't it be great if there was a sequel? Oh. And, and discovered, whoa! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and what a sequel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... Uh, who was the group? Who were the people that you were playing with around this time? So, uh, so like the first school, they were school friends. Yeah, school um, friends. Yeah. So we would play at lunchtime, and then there was a quite amenable couple of teachers. Uh, one of them I remember his name was Joe Warrior, who um, he played D and D with his friends, uh, and then he ran it for some of the boys at school. And um, he had some very interesting house rules, but you only learn later that the way you've been taught to play D and D is not quite correct. Mm. You trusted the teacher figure who was telling you things. There are all these rules about, you know, binding wounds and um, lightning bolt, interestingly, was effectively not an area attack weapon at all. Yeah. But, and so there were all these interesting things that later you began to realise, that's not quite right. But yeah, and as we played most lunchtimes. And then really, my, one interesting part of my kind of history of what happens, we played D&D for quite a while. And then I discovered this book in a bookshop um, called Cults of Prax. And I decide this is going to be ideal for my D&D game. I'm going to basically rip off whatever this rip off D&D rune quest thing is that, you know, I was, you very, in those days you were very tribal and yes. all these things that weren't D&D were just poor knockoffs and you didn't want to really support them. But I thought, well, this could be a useful book to my uh, have as an edition. So I read it and I was transfixed by this well thought out mythology um, and particularly also by the, there's a narrative, the travels of Bituarian Baroche. Uh, and his kind of adventures, and each one would highlight a different cult. And the the description of kind of the play that seemed to be happening there, I was I was like, this is amazing, because this isn't just going down a dungeon. There are people here actually having you know uh, uh, events that seem much more like a story in a book that I was reading. So I went out and bought RuneQuest, thinking, well, you know, I'll, maybe if I see what the rest of this game is like, I can figure out which bits to borrow from my D and D game. And eventually, I got a RuneQuest, and it was kind of like. Wow, there are no character classes, and, and armor basically absorbs damage, and this is so much better. D and D is completely wrong about everything. <laughs> we're playing Request now, uh, and so we, then we played Request for quite a while. Actually, one of the things though is that we uh, certainly uh, we played Request more on the holidays because then we had a whole day or, or two. And we'd actually then play Borderlands and our campaign like that. But then one of the things we switched to playing a lot in lunchtime was Call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu yeah. became a big game that we then ran. Um, and we really only met that because we'd gone through RuneQuest, fallen in love with Chaosum, and then they brought out this game called Cthulhu. And that transformed a lot of the way we thought about play because it was no longer dungeons. There was actually, you know, mysteries to solve. Yeah. Um, and that was, I think, quite transformative. And then since that gave us keys to unlock playing Traveller, which we then came back to after all those years of, you know, Four or five years after first having drawn up traveller characters, we actually figured out how you play the game. Um, yeah. But excellent. Yeah, yeah it, it's interesting that um, of these interviews that I've had with people, um, Call of Cthulhu you know, it had a significant impact on everyone, and it, it was really disruptive, wasn't it, at the time in people's thinking? I think the other thing people always forget, I guess, um, if they're not our age, is that. In a pre-internet world, all of our news, really, information was came through our regular copy of White Dwarf. When White Dwarf was a, you know, gaming magazine that covered all the games that essentially Games Workshop sold, and it was effectively an advertising vehicle. And of course, Games Workshop had the license to print uh, a number of games, RuneQuest, called Cthulhu, which made them much cheaper um, because you weren't importing them and paying uh, huge amounts on that. And of course, they supported them in um, uh, their magazine, yeah. and that led, I think, to um, actually people getting quite a diverse diet of gaming in in the UK that I think potentially other other areas didn't necessarily always get. You could buy in the US, you bought your Dragon magazine, and you know you were really in D and D and a few other TSR products, but there's a real diversity. In I think it's a bit like people always talk about why so many good musicians came out of the UK. It was because Radio One played everything. Yes. So you got loads of influences, and I think there was a period where, it, because White Dwarf forced everybody to, well, didn't force everyone, but exposed everyone to a wide range of games. Um, people were actually played quite a range of games, not just D and D over here. Yeah. And uh, unlike a lot of people that I've interviewed, you actually had a, a deep freeze, didn't you? you? You had a period of time when you, you stopped playing. Yeah. So 
I, I mean, I think it's, I, I've spoken to some people it's, it's not uncommon with, I think, that yeah. when I got into my 20s, and I'd left university, and I was busy establishing my kind of self in the world, there was really no time for um, gaming. Uh, mm. And so I was, you know, drinking beer, chasing women, um, uh, uh, working, trying to establish a career, and that really took most of my time. Uh, I still kept track of uh, the worlds I love. So one of the big, you know, things I really love in gaming is secondary world creation. Mm -hmm. And so some of the universes that I love, that I kept track of by every so often popping into a game store, or buying a new supplement for reading. But my, my pl the only way I, I engaged with role playing games was really by reading at that at that point. Um, and that really continued throughout a lot of the nineties. Um, and uh, a couple of things I think uh, changed that for me. And one was, like everybody, you start to get into your 30s, you're a bit more settled, you have a home, you're not necessarily clubbing the entire time anymore. Uh, and the other thing was the emergence of the internet uh, uh, had meant that I, there was another way now of contacting other gamers, or, and it became easier to then say, well actually, there are other gamers out there. And so I got involved with some of the mailing lists for Verantha, and it's like, wow, there's this whole group of people who are passionate about the world, debating endlessly, minutia of the of of, 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 the, of, the, of the lozenge and what goes on there, and you know, discovered that Greg had written King of Sartar, and that the, the, although there weren't role-playing books coming out, he was writing his backgrounds to effectively uh, most of the mythology and the world, and there's. This magazine called Tales of Richie Moon was out there, and these guys seemed to be supporting stuff. And so the internet opened that door, I think, to um, recontacting a lot of fandom. And then when Chris started to produce a new game, uh, Hero Wars, which is very different to RuneQuest, for good or bad, I think uh, you know, a lot of RuneQuest fans were disappointed that it wasn't essentially uh, RuneQuest. We can get back to what I think happened there. Um, but for me, it was liberating. Here was this storytelling system. Here was something you could, I could clearly see you could play a lot of story in a few hours. Um, and so I then said, well, I'm going to find a group with this new game and I'm going to start playing again. And right. so Hero Wars brought me back into gaming. Right. Um, and that's, I remember you saying, I met you first at uh, UK Games Expo last year, and you said that you, know, you get to a point where you're playing with a group that the dice roll uh, resolution isn't as important anymore as your kind of discussion around the table. So, I, and, and that struck a chord for me, uh, but that's not something I've been able to achieve coming back into gaming. It has been mm. very focused on uh, resolution uh, things. Mm. So what, what are the elements that you need to get to that level where people feel comfortable doing that? Yeah, I, mean, it's, it's, I, just want, I just want to go back a little step and I'll yeah. go forward. Yeah. So the one thing that I, when, when it came out, I think there were a lot of people who very much were steeped in traditional role-playing games like RuneQuest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what they probably hadn't necessarily clocked is that at some point Greg diverges, right? And he has Pendragon, which is essentially his next generation of RuneQuest, but he also has Prince Valiant. Mm -hmm. Prince Valiant, the storytelling uh, game. And uh, HeroQuest, or Hero Wars as it was then, descend much more from Prince Valiant. Uh, and in fact, much of what we think of as kind of indie gaming from Apocalypse World, Hill Folk, all those kind of games actually descend from Prince Valiant. And really, I think more so than, say, Ghostbusters, which is often held up as this, big, where the Kelsey guys begin the indie movement with pool systems. But Prince Valiant is the first uh, game to accept you to use the phrase a storytelling game and talking about having a conversation and occasionally needing a resolution system. And it has. And there's now in here a quest, simple extended contest, first of all. A lot of those ideas are already all in Prince Valiant. Um, and so Prince Valiant, if you not, if you you know, as a as a grognard, it really falls in your era, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people didn't didn't tra trace through that that particular side of what happened. And it's interesting, maybe if some of you need to go back and look at Prince Valiant and see, you can begin to see the antecedents of some of those games out there. And they may help in that direction. But I think what, one of the things that we, we felt a little bit was that um, in a lot of cases, once a group has a, agrees how the world works, um, once we agree what's possible, not, not, not possible, it's then quite easy for us, I think, to say, well, could you do that? Yeah, maybe. Well, just give me a role, right? And a lot of people 
I think playing basic role playing games, for example, drift towards that with a kind of like just give me a dex times five roll or a or in times three roll, right? And so we're, we're just measuring what we think we probability of something being possible are and giving someone a roll to try and to try and say, well, that, we want to add some uncertainties to whether you succeed for tension, so mm-hmm. we'll roll the dice. And then people just literally, some people get to high and low, right? I mean, that's a bit too far for me. But the system becomes much simpler. And sometimes, if, you know, the combat comes up and people are like, I don't want to play out a whole combat. Let's just have a roll, right? One roll. Uh, roll me, give, you know, roll your sword and I'll, and I'll roll with the other one. One roll will resolve the combat. And that, because people want to keep moving on with the story and something has happened which logically we now have to deal with, but it's kind of tangential to the story we want to tell. Um, and particularly as we get older, we don't have that, like I said, you know, when we played RuneQuest, we used to be in the, in the school holidays, and we had like a day to play at RuneQuest, mm-hmm. right? And then suddenly, if you're actually meeting in the evening with your friends, and by the time you've all, you know, eaten something and chatted and caught up on the gossip, you're probably up two and a half hours play at, at yeah. a good night. Having something that you can move at pace through is definitely, you know, a lot better. And like, there's a D&D group that I occasionally play with. And they do a thing like this very much. They um, they will play a bit of a combat, and then they may say, "Oh, we're going to end it narratively," because right. they decide that the the tension's got out of it. Now we're just into the meat grinder section, and they don't want to play that. So they basically the GM describes what happens at the end of the combat, and then they move on, sort of thing. Because in two and a quarter hours, they're not going to. It's going to take forever to complete you know an average D and D campaign. So they they move more quickly through it. So there is that aspect, but I think you have to really trust each other. I think when you when you are a teenager, we, we all disagreed on what was possible. You know, how far can you jump? Well, <laughs> right. You know, that would be an argument for several hours. But at least the rules <laughs> told us, and so you you just listen to what the rules said about how far someone can jump, or how high something is, or how much it hurts to get hit by something. Right. And that those rules essentially prevented all those arguments because we didn't really have agreement about how the world works. Um, but if you can get a group that has agreement about how the world works, then you can apply with a much lighter rule set, uh, if you want to. Yeah. Um, now, th- there's a downside, and that's this. Um, some people, for them, role-playing games, they want to participate more than they want to um, uh, direct the action via basically you know, role-playing their character strongly. And what they really want to do is just roll dice for their, for their character, and they and they particularly like it when it comes to the big, the big combat, etc., because then really they feel they can, they feel confident enough about um, saying what they're doing because they have all these options on their character sheet. They pick their options. Come, you know, as it comes to my strike rank, this is what I'm doing, and they get a lot of participation through the process. The mechanical process invites them to participate at certain points. Whereas when it gets in more, in, just into a more free form, you're wandering around town talking to people, etc. Those people are often quite quiet. Mm-hmm. And the problem with a more storytelling game is it, it doesn't have that mechanical um, entry point for you in the same way. Uh, you know, we, we do get basically contests and you get to roll the dice, but you still have to describe what you're doing to make it interesting because the, the, the mechanics are not telling you exactly what's happening. And those people, I think, they can struggle a little bit more with more of a storytelling game approach because it's not in their comfort zone to be a storyteller. Uh, their comfort zone is much more in participating, rolling the dice. I, I'm, not, I'm not being pejorative about that. Everyone, everyone gets what the you know, you know, important thing is everyone has fun, right? Yeah. But it's more a warning that those people will find, I think, storytelling games harder to enjoy. Yeah. Uh, but if you are the kind of people that, um, for you, most of the session is about the entertaining banter between the players and what's going on, etc. Effectively, storytelling games basically can be a real benefit because you move away from the we're now got to spend an hour doing the fight thing. You need to say, well, we can just do that in 10, 15 minutes and we can get back to the banter, which is yeah. what we really like. So uh, Hero Wars turned into Hero Quest. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's uh, look at that then. And we're going to do a special bit now. This is going to be Judge Cooper's rules. So we've <laughs> sat Blythe for one show only. Oh. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so I have to do this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Judge Cooper rules. Right. So, how did how did it become? Uh, so, how did Hero uh, Hero Wars become Hero Quest? So, what was that journey? Well, uh, in terms of name, um, Greg had always essentially had the name Hero Quest described in the back of RuneQuest books as the the pat, the system where effectively you would be able to um, do hero questing in Glorantha, which was this activity whereby you travel back to the mythic ages. 
uh, of the, the stories of the gods, and you participate basically in the stories of the gods, and you and you keep by doing so gain magical power. And that's what hero questing. That got nicked for a board game, uh, <laughs> and uh, then the board, the company that owned basically the board game, let the rights uh, lapse to the name, and so Greg picked it up again uh, and changed um, Hero Wars into being Hero Quest because Hero Wars was one of the first games set in Grantha which had rules and mechanics for being able to do this activity of going to mythic ages and basically hero questing. Um, whereas RuneQuest had never, never reached that point, but these, the rules existed within Hero Wars. So it's the first time we ever saw that. And so they wanted to emphasize hero questing as a key thing that you could do in this game that made it very different. Um, the other thing Hero Wars to Hero Quest, the first edition of Hero Quest, there were two editions of Hero Quest, right? And there's the first edition of Hero Quest. And that was really because the RuneQuest players had really struggled quite a lot with how to play Grantha using this storytelling engine that was very alien to them. The first edition of Hero Quest was an attempt to try and create a hybrid in a way. It tried to appeal more to uh, in presentation to RuneQuest players to say, well, here's something that perhaps is more comp understandable to your mm -hmm. this is from presentation of it. Um, that was okay, but I think what happened was it, it became a bit incoherent around the ages of the system. So then we did a new edition, HeroQuest Core is called HeroQuest Grant through the same system, we can go to HeroQuest 2, um, we dropped a lot of the stuff that had basically been added in that version of HeroQuest, which is um, seen as mechanically unnecessary and had really made the game system not work as well as it could. Uh, and People at like that stage either got it and were playing a storytelling game, or they were never going to get it and weren't, weren't choosing to touch it. And the emergence of RuneQuest and 13th Age as separate game systems has really helped with that kind of direction, saying it can be its own thing. It doesn't need to try and basically appeal to RuneQuest players by um, having, you know, uh, measuring the world mechanics and that kind of etc. going on. So that was kind of the change. So HeroQuest Core is really, if you like, the purest version of what Robin Law was originally was trying to do, and goes in the one that most directly follows kind of the Prince Valiant storytelling model that Greg had originally kind of created. So it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's liberated of a lot of edge cases and special rules and tries to just be focused on its core mechanic. So Robin, Robin Laws, uh, used to have played uh, Dying Earth mm -hmm. and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, and I, with, with uh, Robin's uh, uh, game design, um, I, I usually describe it as a structuralist in report, in mm. approach, so it's almost a step removed, so it's trying to deconstruct storytelling and then reconstruct it. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's quite a lot about emulating, I think, styles and genre, right? I think that's yeah. quite a big focus for Robin. Um, and. I mean, interestingly enough, the, one of the things he was trying to emulate with Hero Wars was Greg's unpublished kind of novels. Right. Um, uh, and the way that basically Greg had written about what happens in Grantha was one of the things he was trying to emulate. But also, you know, I think there's definitely to the game system a quite cinematic feel. And uh, if you like cinematic role playing, and that's a, I think that's quite true of Robin's work, um, then you'll quite like, I think, how Hero Quest works. If you're, if, if cinematic, is, is not your thing. If gritty, hard realism is more your thing, you may not like yes. the way yeah. that uh, Hero Wars and Hero Quest work. But I also find that, um, so when I'm playing it, when I'm in it, I understand uh, what I'm supposed to do. But when I'm outside of it, um, I, I find it difficult. And I think I would struggle as a games master to describe the rules. So while I've got you, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna record this for prosperity. So when I'm struggling, uh, I know what to do. So, are you all right to go through that? Yeah, I can do that. Thing. Thing, so. what, what I might do is start with the system, and then yeah, we'll yeah. do character creation, and then we'll, we'll, we'll do master as, a, 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 as part of the resolution. So, we'll yeah, do it that way. Fine. Yeah, let's do that way. So, let's talk about resolution. Okay. And I've got a big it's, it's, D20. It's a bit too friendly. Look, <laughs> when, we, when we roll it, it makes, I think, can it, 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 it actually come through on the mic. It's yeah, that's satisfying fine. kind of yeah. clunk, isn't it? it Make people's heads <laughs> ring, yeah, when they hear it. So, um, uh, HeroQuest is what we call is an opposed D20 resolution system. What do we mean by that? Well, it means that you roll a D20 and the GM rolls a D20. And so there is the, the, in order for a roll to happen, there must be some kind of active resistance. If nothing is resisting what you're trying to do and you have an ability on your character sheet, we declare it as an auto success. So if, you just get, if your thief is just going to pick a lock and there's no real time pressure or danger or the guards wandering by, we just say, actually, you succeed, right? No whiff factor. You have the ability on your character sheet that says you can do that, you do that. 
But let's imagine that there is some kind of threat uh, that means that we, we want to roll. Okay. So we're going to come back in a little bit. We'll circle back on conflict versus task. That's just the basic mechanic. So you, on your character sheet, you have an ability, and your ability has a number against it. Now just for a minute, assume it's rated 1 to 20. Your goal is to roll under that number, right? So if your ability is 15, you're going to try to roll under it. So I've rolled 4. That's under my ability of 15. So that is a success. If I rolled, I don't know, what, what's that one for a minute? If I rolled, let's, let's not roll. If I rolled a... a <laughs> my demo is <laughs> not A 17, then that's a failure. Okay, so I failed to do what I said. And then we have, because we're a role-playing game, a 1 is a critical, done it, I succeeded exceptionally well, and a 20 is a fumble. Um, something has gone horribly wrong. And both the GM and the player roll uh, against the number. So the GM has basically a difficulty number, and that is set by the GM's interpretation of what kind of resistance the, it would be appropriate for um, the game in terms of how much risk do the players need right now. Do they need an easy thing? Do they need a hard thing? Um, credibly in the world, how hard might this be? How easy might this be? So the GM kind of makes a finger in the wind judgment call, um, which is just you know, really in some way nod to the reality if that's how GMs have always tended to do those kind of uh, task-based systems. Um, a GM chooses a number and he rolls as well. So you've got now, you've got either a success, failure, critical or a fumble, and the GM has got a success, failure, critical or a fumble. So we compare the two results, okay? So critical beats a success, a success beats a failure, and a failure beats a fumble. So if we have different levels of results, that's it. We know who's won. If we have the same level of result, so I succeed and you succeed, then the higher roll wins. But that also applies if we both fail. Okay. So if we both fail, the higher roll still wins. And that system is essentially what we call a simple contest. Now, we can look at the difference between the two results that we've got, and we can grade the level of victory or, or, the, the, you, or defeat that you just had. You don't have to do it all the time, but that gives us, you can have more information and say, well, this is a minor or major um, victory or defeat, and that gives us an idea of how well you succeeded or how badly you failed. Um, but you don't, have to, you don't have to use it all the time. There's an extended contest. So, an, so what's the tradition of a simple extended contest? So the idea in HeroQuest is that we have what's called conflict resolution. And so the, way I offer, the example I often use is this. Let's say that I want to steal the necklace um, from the princess's bedroom. The, it has, has magical properties and we, and, we, and we desperately need this necklace. Now, we may describe in fiction of the game world that the princess's necklace is in her bedroom, in her, in, in her jewellery box. Her bedroom is inside the uh, nobleman's house in town, which is guarded by his elite guards. Uh, with inside a, a walled compound where the garden is patrolled by tigers um, and uh, you know, the outer wall basically has locked and barred gates. But what we care about in HeroQuest is what is your objective, right? And your objective is to steal basically the necklace. So we can do it in HeroQuest, we let you do it with one roll. You simply say, I'm a thief, I'm going to steal the necklace. And you may, we, we, we may say to you, what are you going to use to do that? You may say a thief keyword. You might even say, well, I'm a thief and I've got a pick locks ability, so I'm going to use that. And cinematically, because it's Robin Laws, what we're really focusing on is what's the key scenes we see as you're doing your break-in to get the necklace and get away with it. Okay. And that's just as it on one roll and we're done. And we assume that what we're trying to do there is in terms of pacing, we're keeping the story moving. The, the stealing the necklace is just what is, is the next step in a larger story. And what we're really trying to get to is the next steps more important. That's just not the focus of the night's play, this little tiny little job we're doing. So we just want to do it in one roll. Or essentially, because when I look at my character sheet, I've got an ability to thief, and I'd keep describing, oh, well, I use my thief to sneak past the tigers. Oh, I use my thief to, it gets a bit dull. We're just going to have one role which says, you're a thief, you do your stuff, right? Now, an extended contest says, no, 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 the heist is the focus of the night's play. We really want to see this person shine. Um, and he's got all these ideas. He's got basically, he's prepared his drugged meat for the tigers, and he's got his um, sleeping powders for the guards, and he's got his, his knife to get the last guard if he needs to. And, and the character's got all these abilities listed on his character sheet, and he really wants to use them all. So in an extended contest, we have a series of roles, a series of those simple roles, 
Um, we just and it's the, and each time you're scoring points based upon the difference. Like so, critical versus success is two points. Critical versus failure is three points, right? And the first person to get to five kind of wins. So the GM kind of narrates your progress depending upon points as you sneak through effectively the, uh, the, 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 the noble's mansion to steal the princess and necklace. So extended contest is kind of that focus. And in a sense, most games, most other games, their combat mechanics, all those kind of things, are, are extended contest equivalents. You're really focused in. What Hero Quest lets you do is a lot of the time summarize that as one role. And one of the things to really to master the game is to actually say, play a lot and confine yourself just to those, those single role games to begin, begin with. It changes your perspective on play because suddenly you move from an hour of tonight's entertainment as the GM is going to be, I'm just going to set up a fight and we're going to have, have this fight, to I need to keep the story moving, right? I need to actually throw new events at the players. I need to improvise stuff. And that faster play of, pace of play becomes quite attractive. I'm just running for a new group um, at the Roleplay Haven in Arch when I'm running my campaign, uh, The Eleven Lights. Um, and we went five sessions before we had an extended contest um, because we were playing, we were moving fast, and there didn't ever seem to be a need to, to come to a point where we focused in and the players could really, you know, had a lot of options that they wanted to do. So what you're looking for as a GM is players saying, oh, and I want to do this and this and this, and you're right, this is an extended contest, right? As your player just says, I just want to get the necklace, right? Simple contest. That's how it kind of works. So, a couple of little tweaks. One is bumps. So, um, I can bump a roll. And what I mean by bumping a roll is you improve it by one level. So, fumble becomes failure, failure becomes success, success becomes critical. Okay. Two things that you bump. One is we get hero points, Benny's in the game, effectively, you get one at the beginning of the session or three at the beginning of the session. You roll them, and it says basically, effectively, when, when you spend a hero point, I, put, I improve my result by one. So, so it's a way of the player saying, no, I don't want to lose this contest. I'm going to basically improve my result by one. Um, or mastery. Now, Hero Quest scales. So it lets you represent abilities higher than 20. Okay, so I can have an ability which essentially is like 28. As an obvious problem, if we have a 20-sided dice <coughs> and my ability is 28, <coughs> I'm going to succeed quite a lot. Um, and that's okay. We want you to succeed. But then what happens if I've got 28 and you've got 27? Hmm, surely there should be a bit of a challenge here somewhere, but, it, but it's not going to work because we're just all both going to succeed the whole time. So what we actually do is we basically say, right, we're going to effectively divide your ability by 20 and take the remainder. Right? So if I have 27, the remainder is 7, and we basically take the 20 and call it a mastery. So if I had 47, it would be two masteries, basically, and a 7. And what we say is, if my, with my seven mastery, if I'm going up against a resistance, uh, or another, which essentially it doesn't have a master, like 14, for example, then I roll to roll under the seven, you try to roll under the 14, but I have this master in hand and I bump my result by one. Right? So I, in the resistance rolls 13 and succeeds. Um, I roll 15, which ought to be a failure, but because of my ability to say seven mastery. But actually what happens is I bump it to a success. And that's a success on a 15, now I have the better success and I win. If two of you have a mastery, so the resistance was you know, 40 mastery and you have seven masteries your ability, we drop the master that masters off, just roll 14 versus seven. So we simplify it at that point. That's a way of letting us scale to bigger and bigger numbers, but actually then taking those, when, when, the, you know, when Godzilla fights basically King Kong, we can drop away all the masters and just have seven versus nine, right? Um, and that's the way that kind of scales. So, uh, character uh, creation. So what happens in HeroQuest is, um, uh, there are a number of methods actually in HeroQuest Core. So HeroQuest Core has three, narrative, um, uh, as you go, and list. List and as you go are actually the same thing. Um, and HeroQuest Glorantha only, only kept the as you go one. So, so we'll describe as you go first. As you go says you create basically a distinguishing characteristic, which is just an ad adjective to type your character, like fiery tempered, or um, loving, or, um, uh, um, compassionate, and you choose generally an occupation keyword, right? So thief or bandit or um, uh, intergalactic smuggler, um, uh, and uh, with that, you then say we, we, you've got a certain number of abilities you can create. Um, Hero Quest Core would be, I think you get. Uh, anyone remember how many ability points you get? I think it's twenty. I, think, I can't remember. Um, I have to look it up. I think. 
uh, and a number of ability points to spend to raise basically those um, uh, abilities to a high level. And so what happens is as you play, you simply say, well, my intergalactic smug smuggler, he'd, he'd of course have uh, be better at starship pilot. So I'm going to basically put starship pilot under intergalactic smuggler. Um, so that's my keyword, I'm going to break out, I cross off one of my abilities basically, and I say actually I'm going to put some points into it as well. So I cross off from my pool of 20 points, I'll have another five points, and now I'm uh, starship pilot plus six on my intergalactic smuggler, uh, which is a keyword which is probably rated about 17. Right? Um, and so as you go, you can begin to fill out the details of your character um, in play. Um, and w there's a trick to it as well, which is when you roll and you fail, that's when you put some of your pool of additional points in to help push your ability up to enough to basically actually turn that into a crit or whatever, etc. instead. So that's um, uh, kind of the character creation method. There is another method, which is basically called, it's called 100 Words, which is just also, it's still in the HeroQuest core, where I write a short narrative mm -hmm. of my character, and then I go through and I underline uh, things that look like abilities, um, and that's my character generation process. And the original idea was you could take, you go and, if you go and find a description of a character in fiction, you know, a description of, say, um, Conan, effectively, <coughs> but take a section of the text that's right, I've been 100 words, and literally underline the words, and those were the abilities the character would have. Um, and so that still exists in the core version. Grantha just went for the as you go um, as being the very easy yeah. get everyone on board, get them playing fast option for your first grant. And the, the as you go works really well, doesn't it? Because you can uh, build a character that has had experience. It's a real use of ex uh, mechanical yeah. experience. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. as you, And the other thing is, you, for people who are new to, say, the game, you can get playing and then make decisions about your character. Rather than being forced to make decisions about a character in a world you don't necessarily know anything about or understand, and, you, and then three sessions in think, I really regret yes. um, playing this character because if I'd known what the world was like, I'd have played one of these. Essentially, you can pretty much do that within HeroQuest because you can adjust your character as you're going along to actually fit your, your needs better. Yeah. Um, you can choose new, whole new abilities that really take your character in a quite different direction, deciding, oh, this is what I want to play, so this is what my character's going to be. And the trick is finding descriptive words that have a broad sense, isn't it? So, uh, I know my character in the uh, uh, current game of uh, Coming Storm <coughs> is, uh, has a mastery of husbandry mm -hmm. in its widest sense. And uh, so, um, it allows me to get away with all sorts. Um, and, and one of the interesting things with that is those terms, for they have one at the table, has a feel for what it means yeah. inside your game um, uh, what you could do with that ability, then you can be really quite poetic. And we're talking the other night about, you know, Molly Ringwald is a popular yes. topic uh, that comes up occasionally. And saying, you know, Molly would could have an ability in under Hero Quest of Pretty in Pink. That would be an ability. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we could use it for anything we felt Molly could do by wearing a pink, you know, a pink dress, etc. And that would be that would be a classic Molly ability. Um, yeah. And it's that's that's that idea of uh, we're talking about. Guys, guys, talk about that idea we're talking about earlier, saying. You have to be playing this kind of game with a group where everyone kind of gets it, and we're not going to argue about you know the length of the sword and what that means basically in terms of distance and reach and who attacks first in order. We don't want any of that stuff. If we all agree that basically we understand whether you know, whether magenta counts as pink. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to. I'm going to erect this uh, screen in front of us. And we're going to do, again, I've got a, a, a table of random things on here. And I'm going to roll this dice, so <laughs> apparently at random, on this table. And, uh, and, uh, and see what comes up. So, wait a second. That's an eight. An eight is Glorantha and uh, Greg Stafford. Because, of course, this weekend uh, we're celebrating the life of Greg Stafford. Uh, and you, of course... Uh, spent time with him and to, to explore his world so I wonder if you could share some of uh, those memories that you've had. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so uh, when I when I, kind of, when I kind of got back into gaming, uh, one of the places you participated in Grantham fandom was uh, the Grantham Digest which is basically a mailing list and I was involved with some people talking about um, gaming in basically Dragon Pass and they were doing a book for uh, Hero Wars uh, called Barbarian Adventures and it was designed to be a first kind of adventure book for playing 
the classic or lengthy characters uh, in Dragon Pass. Um, and I'd had some discussions about what I thought the kind of adventures people should play in that. And Greg reached out to me and said, "Would you like to write something uh, for the for this for this for this uh, um, scenario book?" And I, it was kind of one of those, you know, um, put up or shut up moments, right? Where you where you were, I was a bit surprised to be asked, but it was kind of well, I keep banging on about what I think should happen. It's time to prove what, that I that I could do that. And I then wrote something. It's very short. It's in by Ben called Blood Feed. It's quite a short adventure. It turned out it was a lot harder than I thought. But Greg um, <laughs> gave me lots of feedback, uh, and we turned in, turned it into something that was actually quite workable. And that kind of process then led to me getting involved in other projects, writing a bit more material for other things. I got involved with a. Um, uh, a group called Unspoken Word. But that kind of thing is quite common for people's stories of Greg. That Greg was a huge enabler of others. And so when we talk about Greg's career, I think a lot of people focus on Grantha and Pendragon as being, you know, his 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 his, his great works, his his work, great work of setting creation and his great work of scholarly enthusiasm and passion for the King Arthur story. But the thing we also need to talk about Greg is he was a huge enabler. You know, Sandy Peterson would say, without, without Greg, there's no Call of Cthulhu. Because the person that believed in the idea, the person that pushed him to get, to get something across in the gaming book that reflected how he felt Lovecraftian stories should work, was Greg. And that's, that's a lot of the story you hear, is um, someone who is incredibly creative, yet at the same time want to enable other creators. And Greg said he had a kind of a dream um, for Grantha, that he he would never be able to, he realised to, in, had the time to detail Grantha in the way that he wanted, and so he had a dream once he said of a pool of writers who would work with him on on, on detailing his world, and he said that that came true through the act of role playing. Huge numbers of other people came together and all wanted to participate with him in designing and developing this world. Now. At times, you know, that's, that's good or bad. There's the famous thing called Gregging, where essentially you'd work carefully on something and then Greg would say, oh, no, I've changed my mind about how that all works. And you'd be looking at the, you know, ashes of your notes, effectively thinking, oh, start again. Um, because he had a very passionate vision about how he saw, for example, Grantha and how it works. But at the same time, creatively, it was enormously great, good training ground because you learnt from, you know, one of the masters of his craft how you built stuff and, and got it working. And that, certainly without Greg's influence on me as a writer, there'd be no coming storm, there'd be no Eleven Lights. Um, and even at the point of the Eleven Lights, you know, Greg is helping us out. Greg is design, you know, coming up with the idea for the big hero quest at the centre of that book. Um, but uh, his, his, his style had become a little bit different. He would just, he drew up a whole, you know, here's the hero quest and kind of drawn up as a kind of like map, with, as, a, as an inner world artifact document. And he did a lot of stuff where he moved towards a model saying, I'm gonna help writers, but I will give them in-world background and artifacts. So that there's lots of room for you to interpret and play with it. It's not completely set in stone, but I want to creatively stimulate your ideas. And so he was a great collaborator. That's the other thing about, about Greg. And what you, uh, what, what you said uh, on his passive words, so you're gonna miss the conversation. So. Mm. Perhaps you could share how some of those conversations went. Well, interesting. I mean, when, when actually I used to talk to Greg a lot of cons, we didn't actually talk that much about Grantha. And we talked mainly about Grantha when we were working on a project together. So, and, we, and when we had uh, personal conversations, it was quite often about children, about my relationship. Uh, I, 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 there was a period where I was going through a divorce with a first partner. Um, and about politics. And I think sometimes Greg quite likes the escape of being able to go to a con and uh, talk to people who, who weren't just obsessively going to ask him about uh, Garantha and Pendragon. There were seminars, etc., where he was very willing to do that. Um, but I think that he, he quite liked to meet the fans as people. Um, and he was very, you know, he was hugely aware that any role-playing uh, author or publisher, um, it's the fans that essentially have, have made you, right? And Greg was very aware that his fans had stuck with him and his creations during some dark times in his life uh, in the 90s, uh, and that uh, he owed a lot to the fans. But he also, I think, wanted to talk to the fans as people, not just as 
you're a fan of my work, he wanted to actually dig a bit deeper and actually get to know people and find out a bit more about them and who they were. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, roll again. It's one, and that means it's a critical. Uh, so, the Coming Storm campaign. So, tell us something about the red cows. Right. So, um, uh, and it's an interesting genesis. So, what <coughs> happens is that I wrote with Greg the Dragon Pass uh, Gazetteer, and we took ideas from Greg's own campaign discussions of Dragon Pass, but also from some of the more celebrated fan creations, so the Grey Dogs, which was the Tales crew. Um, John Hughes had done this great work with basically the Far Place, and there's another whole, another whole group of the German guys who'd done a whole lot of the thing called the Colbria. This is Eric called the Sincina, and Greg had some hand drawn maps of bits of it. Um, and I thought, oh, this area looks really interesting because you've got some conflict between the clans, the classic little empty clans in Granthra, always effectively fighting with each other. You know, I, I detest the invading, occupying ports of the Lunar Empire, but my neighbour is worse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and they also had the Telmori, who were this tribe of werewolves. And as werewolves, of course, are immune to non-magical weapons, very, very difficult to kill. Um, and they'd wiped out a large section of the population in the um, east of the country uh, until basically the, this is where Sata comes from and he brings peace, etc. And that's why the kingdom's called Kingdom of Sata. And it looked very interesting as an area. Um, and at the same time, I was very much uh, into the, the idea that there was a classic kind of campaign that people were running for uh, Hero Wars and Hero Quest. And that was essentially you play a clan, the life of a clan. So you play through their struggles. Um, and some people called it kind of like the farmer's campaign, where essentially you just played common folk trying to survive in the face of the terrible things that were happening during the big build up to the hero wars. Uh, and to do that, though, you need, it takes quite a bit of effort. You have to generate all the NPCs that you might need. You have to think about you know, the years that flow. Yeah, at the same time, the other strand is King of Dragon Pass, which is essentially a computer game. Um, uh, set effectively in Grantha, where it's this kind of early history of this area where you are a new settler arriving after the area has basically been off limits for hundreds of years because the dragons have killed everybody but eventually circumstance forced people to, to enter this haunted land and uh, settle there. And people love this thing in King of Dragon Pass where effectively you're playing the clan and every so often you know you get strange challenges would pop up and you have to try and deal with them and keep your clan, clan survival. So this idea of playing a, a game as a Atlantic clan was quite big. And so what I wanted to do is, was really create uh, the NPCs, the background for a whole clan, basically. What, you know, what, what, did, the, what did the land look like? Where were all the farms and the villages located? Who were the important, who were the important people and folk there? And then play a game using that material to kind of half improvise and half do kind of prepared adventures. And originally it started a thing called the Book of Red Cow, which is a free PDF that I gave away. And that was, originally I started playing in a kind of, pr in an earlier period of history when essentially a, a neighbouring tribe, the Maboda, were wiped out by the Wolfmen. And I wanted to tell the story of how that happened with my players. Mm. So I played that for a while, and then we wanted to jump forward ten years and then start playing at the beginning of the Hero Wars. And essentially that is the period which is where the coming storm is set, about 1618, where... Um, it's the beginning of the lead up to the hero wars, the Sartorites throwing off basically the lunar occupation of their land um, uh, by raising a dragon. But what I wanted to do in this one was tell the story from the perspective of your clan. Rather than the perspective of heroes in epic fantasy saving the world, I wanted to tell the story of what happens to your clan when all this stuff is going down. How do you actually, as people, survive? In, in a, as, a, as this war is raging across everything around you. So it's using this idea of saying, there's a meta plot, sure, but really that's off stage. That's driving events, basically, which you are effectively just all reacting to. Yeah. And I've, I've played a couple of games with you, and uh, I've said that yeah, uh, uh, it comes across uh, in the book your style of play. So with the, the, way, the way that you uh, enrich the descriptions and put detail in there and then put a focus on the things that happen that kind of reflects the way that you play is that, is that your, it, yeah I like to give style. people a sense of, of, of place all right yeah. I like to uh, you know I, I think there's definitely 
but that, I, I know there's, a, there's a pejorative view of the GM as storyteller, which is you're playing the GM story, which, I, which is not what I, I, I'm trying to create. But this idea of the GM as storyteller in that oral storytelling way of transporting you to a place and a time, um, that's, I think, one of the GM's jobs is to help you know, transport you. Interesting, I mean, I did a course in oral storytelling many years ago, and it's interesting quite how oral storytellers work. So what they tell you to do is this. They say, right, first of all, you need to get an idea of all your characters who are going to be in the story. Think about them and think about descriptions. And think about sort of three things you might say about any of them. So, you know, it's the old lady with the you know, one tooth and the wispy white hair, effectively. And you remember those things, right? Think about your places. Where, does it, where, does it, where, does, where is it set? So, you know, here's the old lady's cottage with basically its hole in its roof. It's never been fixed. It drips into the bowl, etc. right? And then typically what they say to you is your story, what you remember is 10 points. 10 things that need to happen in the story. So if you're telling Little Red Riding Hood, you've got to remember effectively, you know, arrive at, got to arrive at grandma's house, uh, got to talk to the wolf at grandma's house, etc. So you, you break down the story into 10 points. And then every telling, you simply create the story anew looking at the reaction of your audience, figuring out which bits they like and don't like, which bits you're going to emphasize. And you, you tell the story of the characters in this, in this world going through these events and you every time. And I think that's quite a good metaphor for role playing in a way that you, as a GM, you want to focus on the, char- the NPCs and the characters in the setting, have a kind of outline idea of where you think the players could go in case nothing else happens. But generally, you just tell the story, and the players, as they react, because you've got a quite flexible story lo- structure, you just you react to what they're doing and emphasise some points, drop others out of the way, and push through. And that, that oral storytelling tradition, I think that's quite a lot to offer um, GMs as a way of playing. And the Eleven Lights is the uh, second uh, volume. Will there be a third volume? So I, I'm writing one. Um, uh, if you all buy enough copies of The Coming Storm and Eleven Lights, I'll be able to convince uh, uh, Jeff to publish it. It could be signed later. Uh, <laughs> um, so the idea, the third volume I've got, the idea is that there are a couple of big events. One of them is the, the Dragon Rise, which is when essentially the Sartorites um, raise a dragon to swallow the assembled um, lunar armies and dignitaries who are creating their, their new Temple of the Reaching Moon, their kind of super weapon. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, it's like it's the Death Star, right? And yeah, this, yeah, is, yeah, of this is the bit where effectively you get to be Luke and, you know, um, uh, fire your torpedoes down, basically the ventilation shaft. So this is, this is that grand moment of the Dragon Rise. And the idea is essentially to present a campaign where um, you can do, rather than being off stage as it is in the Eleven Lights, you can actually bring it on stage and your characters are the ones that essentially raise the dragon. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Hopefully people will be excited by that idea. Yeah, so. yeah definitely. Well, can we roll again? Oh, 20. Oh, fumble. Oh, yeah, that's a fumble. <coughs> uh, so, we don't have fumbles in this table. Uh, so, they... <laughs> I, I'm going to hand wave the fumble away. Well, if your ability is 20 in your request, it's an exception, and it actually just counts as a failure on a 20. Yeah, yeah. There you go. No, we'll, we'll, bump, we'll bump it. We'll bump it. Uh, so, uh, so here request in the age of room quest. Mm, good so, question. Uh, how how is that going to grow and develop? I mean, we have three ways of playing Grant right now: 13th Age, Room Quest, and uh, Hero Quest, um, and. Uh, they appeal, we think, to different kinds of gamers. Robin Laws uh, tweeted a reasonably interesting description the other day, which was um, uh, RuneQuest, fight only when necessary. HeroQuest, fight when dramatically appropriate. Um, and 13th Age, fight. Um, <laughs> which, which I think is quite interesting. But they, I think they just appeal to different styles of gamers. So if, if you are more a, a storyteller, and you, you know, particularly if you want to do crazy mythological journey into the, you know, the, the, the secrets of mythology past sort of thing by hero questing. If storytelling is more your thing, then really hero quest is a game for you. If you're something more traditional and you like the ring quest, gritty combat, and the idea of basically losing limbs on, on, on an evening uh, is what thrills you, uh, your left leg being chopped off or whatever, uh, uh, then, then ring quest is really the kind of system for you. And that, uh, for people who really want to just live in the world, I think that's one of the things that a lot of ring quest players like to, you know, 
what, what would it be like if I was actually there in Grantham? The request will show you that, right? Whereas HeroQuest is much more, um, I mean, it's the cinematic version of living in Grantha, and we don't have to worry about the, some, some of the, the grime. Um, and then the 13th Age is the, its own thing where it's saying, well, I'm going to take the background. It's interesting, creatively interesting, because it's trying to take the background, but actually I'm going to throw it into some kind of idea that you're all fighting against chaos, etc. And so I think it's a great idea, right? Now then, maybe it's because I rolled a fumble, maybe it's because I didn't pay enough on the meter, but due to a technical breakdown, I had to rely on my third reserve recording for the last 10 minutes. This is from my phone that was a little distance away from us. Ian continues to talk about his plans for Hero Quest, and when I present him with a graphic novel of the Ruby Throne, based on Moorcock's Elric of Melnaborne, he gives his side of where he stands on the Moorcock talking divide. Sorry. Grantha is a tool for making for, 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 for playing games. So creatively, you shouldn't ever feel confined by some idea of canon. Canon is only important basically to authors to make sure that we try and not break existing products. But you at the table should just use Grantha as creatively as you possibly can. And that bitch is a real good thing to do. So the idea is to have all three games. Um, uh, now, any game line will obviously have more support and books if it's got more people effectively playing that game. So it's likely that HeroQuest will never equal the, the output in, uh, that we will get out of our request. But at the same time, it's where we want to be, cre some, we be creatively interesting. So we, we, we think our fan base will potentially react well to more creatively interesting products. Whereas in request, you may be more constrained to their saying, well, you want to play in this area because my campaign's been set for years, that kind of thing. Um, so, we, so we may be more creatively interesting, we may explore other parts of the world, we have an idea, we may explore, explore fond reference on other areas. Um, the other thing for the minute is we are remaining what you call in Hero Quest, what we call the classic period, if you like, the, the 1625 and before, with the, you know, where the Dragon Party is occupied by the Little Empire. And Hero Quest is moving on to the Hero Wars themselves. And that gap is just actually pragmatic. I mean, it means we don't have to do horrible project coordination between creators on both sides saying, but you can't do that, I've just killed him over here, right? <laughs> um, and so one of the things that Jeff is going to do, it's kind of actually, I think there's a bit of a reset for the setting and wipe out the NPCs from 1625, just so he doesn't have to worry about, effectively, as he goes forward, he can have new people in those posts. So, so the earlier games don't feel that the, the future fate of those characters has already been decided, essentially. Um, so that's how we'll go for a minute, and at some point we will then probably from your request look at what they've done in request and say, do we want to release a supplement set in that era? And so the idea there would be potentially something like the Eleven Lights or a hero band in the Hero Wars, you might jump forward and show what happens to them during the Hero Wars. But yeah, at the minute we're splitting by timeline, uh, and the only, we hope that people will say the different kind of games. And one thing, I, I, I'm happy to play all of them, right? And because there's something they scratch different itches for me. If I wanted to play a game say in the big rubble where effectively we're desperate treasure seekers um, looking to that one chance basically to score effectively to say you got with your farm or whatever i'd certainly play request that is the right game of that genre right um hero quest would really just not it would get quite bored with that game quite quite rapidly whereas you know if i want to play a clan game it also there's a clan politics and the conflicts as much about you know um you start suddenly discovering you're in debt to that person and uh, that person's now trying to put the squeeze on you, etc. Hero Quest is a great game for that because the flexibility of its system where I can make a debate in a mooting chamber, um, an extended contest with lots of roles and just as exciting as a combat, means that's a real strategy. Yeah. And what about its uh, status as a genetic system? Is that really okay, so we've got plans to, I don't think there's the secret around this at this stage, we're going to produce a new generic version of the game. There'll be tweaks, um, essentially it's cleaning up the writing, uh, fixing a few holes in the rules we don't really like, um, but not a major jump in the way it says the rules. So it's kind of like version 2.2 or 2.3 rather than version 2, right? um, which, is, which is here of course is version 2, so it's just an incremental improvement. But we're going to emphasise again the thing that really never got picked up on, which is the you can use it to play a lot of genres. So the new version will effectively probably have some interesting genre packs in it. What I'm working on at the minute is a is a rocket punk kind of 1950s space opera setting. Um, we've got Ron Edwards working on something that's working title is Cosmic Zap, 
which is playing kind of cosmic level superheroes. Um, you can see on his site at a play, you can see some actual plays of people um, play testing and what his ideas there. Yeah. And we hope to have a pulp setting sorted very soon. Um, and obviously, Andrew is going to write the um, uh, price of breakfast for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, something of a. Uh, no, but I do, I, but, no, so I'm very open to people writing genre packs. Um, and the genre pack effectively is could be somewhere between 8 and 30 pages describing the sort of setting, what we need for keywords, description of your setting, um, and that's enough for the hero class to play. And it, the bigger size to the smaller size is, if you can go with the smaller size, if it's really our world with a few modifications, then I don't have to have much setting background because we know what that is, right? If I'm playing fantasy or science fiction, I'm getting a slightly bigger version because I need to introduce more setting. Um, the other big news on that one really is that we're going to push that out under an SRD, we're going to produce an SRD and put that under an OGL so that other creators can take basically more of that engine and use it to create games. And that's just partially pragmatic, you know, we're never going to be able to basically support the line with enough books to really produce that depth uh, for a more a generic system. So by opening up in that way, we hopefully get a whole range of people to say, well I want to create basically my own setting and here of course is the perfect engine, so I will basically do that. I'm hoping we get a network effect then, essentially, what people playing about. Brilliant, brilliant. Right. One last roll. Ah, it's 11. Now, I've got a gift for you here. Ooh. I work the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want this to uh, prejudice uh, this. <laughs> <laughs> So in the debates of Tolkien versus Walcott, we would use that. <laughs> I um I'm actually Tolkien. And the reason the reason is I love, you know, secondary world creation. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of things like Tekken as well as Paranthe. I think even the Forgotten Realms is a fantastic game, so it's a world creation, even though I'm not a huge DVD player. Um, uh, and, you know, Middle Earth is the kind of preeminent uh, example of secondary world creation, and for that, I, I, I love what I'm talking about. Um, you know, Morcock, uh, you've got to say, here's this guy, basically, who revitalizes sword and sorcery, he's kind of British counterculture, effectively, and all credit for that. But the other thing I'd also say, which is my other controversial point, is I'm going to pick a sword and sorcery that uh, it would be Lieber over Morcock, because he is a he's a fantastic writer, um, uh, and uh, you know anyone who can open one of the, interesting one of their main characters with a snowball fight in the fantasy genre, I think deserves a lot of respect, and he's a, he's a, he's a poet. To me. Yeah. Well, I'll tell that home, and you might want to rethink your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Cooper comes to the end of his tenure, are you going to reinstate Judge Biden? Um, we're in negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, can I just, uh, can I just say uh, thank you very much? Games Master Screen again! Welcome to the room of role playing rambling. I'm joined by Blythe. Hello, Blythe. Hello, Dirk. Now, this is a Games Master Screen. I'm going to put, a, but this time, I'm not going to put a screen in front of you. Oh no, because I have nothing to hide. For we are mutual travellers on the road of narrative and a journey of discovery of ourselves and the possibilities of gaming. Is, it, is this the right podcast? <laughs> I walked into the wrong, <laughs> I walked into the wrong podcast all well, of a sudden. Well, what we're looking at today, uh, it, I think this might be the first one in the series, is looking at rule systems that are available to help you recreate things. Over the uh, next few podcasts we're going to be looking at our influences. So back in the day, what were the things that were influencing our games yes. and how we played them? So some of the media that we were exposed to and how we translated those into games. Now back then it was more about replicating a mood, wasn't it? Well, it, yeah, yeah, it was. And I suppose that those Films, books, and things, TV shows seemed were more relevant in as much as there were less supplements around, there was less material around. I mean, there was a lot of material, but there was less material, wasn't there? Yeah. And the way it was depicted, 
uh, could be a little tricky. The, the, I mean, the best example, which we've talked about lots of times, was, was Traveller, where you know, what did things look like? And we would always draw on Alien, wouldn't we? We'd always say, oh, it's like Alien, or oh, it's like Aliens. So you, you used those other media to... Yeah. Imp- they, they were more, I think they were probably more influential, whereas I think now you could probably buy a, a game and supplements and everything's there for you. The, the other thing is, of course, trying to replicate something like a snow speed of chase using Traveller would be impossible. Uh, yes. It wouldn't be satisfying. Well, it'd be, be boring. It'd be more, boring. More than anything, it'd be boring. You've a tape measure and a <laughs> ruler <laughs> and a calculator. And by then, you'd all go to sleep. <laughs> and what people tell me, and what we're going to start to explore, is that modern rule systems, modern rules technology has advanced so that it's possible to emulate those things yes. more clearly, more yes. easily. Yes. So this Games Master Screen, but there is no screen, mm-hmm. is about some of those different methods of doing it and some of the ones that we've done. Yeah. Now, I know that others are available, and we might perhaps talk about those at the end, but um, these are the ones that we've looked at. Okay. Yeah. Now, normally I have a table, but I don't have a table. Good God. I don't have a table because these are games that do not... They, they've elevated above the status of the table. Oh, yeah, there's no tables. No. None of that. So what I'll do is I'll roll on these dice and we will configure a result. All right, here we go. <laughs> do we even need the dice? Yeah, here we go. Uh, no, do we need the dice? I think, for narrative purposes, a 17 would be good. What do you think as Games Master? I'm going to say... I've got a, I've, I was thinking five... But that bumps you down. a lot higher with 17, haven't I? Yeah, but I've got this card that I kept from earlier, which I'm going to play as an advantage, which knocks down your 17 down to a minus 17. Therefore, I get to pick. Okay. That's fair. mm, It'll never replace dice, will it? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So first up, he's looking at Hero Quest, because this is a Hero Quest... Yeah, uh, podcast. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So playing it here, quest. So Ian's done a better job of explaining the rules than we have. Yes. But what do you think about Hero Quest's ability to look at some of the other genres? So Ian's saying in the interview that you know he's reaching out trying to get genre packs to promote Hero Quest as a universal mechanics engine. Yes. Yeah, I can see that, and I can say it would work very well that perspective because I, I suppose yeah hero quest it's good for adapting things because it is quite fluid isn't it i think one of the problems so looking at a book or a film or a genre and going right i want i want this game to fit that yeah it's all the bits around the edges that are difficult to fit in or don't seem relevant but are still in the system yeah if that makes sense in hero quest because it's about words and phrases that your character's composed of. Yeah. You don't have to worry too much about the finer points of it. Yeah. It's a bit more broad brush. Yeah, all that Hero Quest gives you is a resolution mechanic. Arguably? Yeah, I suppose. We, I pl- we played Hero Quest. I played Hero Quest. I enjoyed Hero Quest a lot. I think one of the tricky things about it when I've tried to is when I've tried to create characters because you're using words and phrases and you're trying to not repeat yourself with the words and the phrases and not be tautologous. And I, I think you're right, the rules give you a great resolution mechanic once you get a head around it. But creating characters can be a bit tricky. Yeah. Because it's... When, whenever I see a Hero Quest character put in front of me, I think, great, oh yeah, uh, this is exciting. They've got words and ideas there that are flo- floating around and I think I can, you can do something with this, it's quite exciting. But when I try and create a Hero Quest character, I find myself scratching my head. Yeah. And using the same words and phrases over and thinking, oh, no, don't use that again. That's the same as that. You yeah. know. Clearly what I'm working on at the moment is uh, Strontium Dog. What we have now that we didn't have back in the 80s is an internet that is full of source material. So it isn't necessary to know everything. So even if you're challenged at the table with something, you can always uh, Google it. <laughs> Google it there and then. <laughs> and then yeah, yeah. That's true. You know, if you get somebody saying, "Oh, I think you'll find that uh, Ktor is part, not part of the uh, Dorinian Nebulus," you'll find that you know you can look it up <laughs> while they're talking, can't you? You, you can. can. You can look it up while they talk because those kind of people will be talking 
for a while. <laughs> so even with a slow internet connection, you can still find out what they're talking about. Yeah. The requirements of having loads of background material is probably diminished a bit because mm. you can just fill your head with enough stuff yeah. to run something at the table. All you need is a resolution mechanic. Does Hero Quest give you a sufficient one? See, I think it's a bit more than just a resolution mechanic, isn't it? Because it does tie back to the characters and the character sheets. But it's very broad. Conceptually, it's very broad, isn't it? So well, it's conceptually scale, broad, scale. and the, the tricky thing is you've got some numbers there, but they're connected to keywords and breakout phrases and things. And I think for a lot of gamers, that runs counter to what they're used to. Because what, what conventional used to is rolling a load of numbers from those numbers concocting a character yeah that that's what we do isn't it so yeah because i tried creating a hero quest character and i found myself just <clears throat> i thought i'd done very well until i read read it back next day and realized it was just essentially very very repetitive i'd repeated i'd focused on a cup just a couple of things really so saying someone's stealthy and saying someone's a thief and you could argue within the context of hero quest that they're the same that's the same thing so you yeah. just need the word thief and you can then draw from that stealthiness. That's where it can be quite tricky. Once your character's created, it's, it's, it's good. But it, that creating characters, I, I found it really difficult to do. Yeah. I rolled a Warhammer character recently, just of a trial run with the four. You bring Warhammer rules. into it, you I, I brought it into it. Um, but this is an example because Warhammer is very different in terms of you random, it's very, very random. You roll on tables for your background, you roll your stats quite randomly. Um, and I ended up with a, a beggar uh, who was quite tough, but his agility and, and initiative were really low. And from that, I thought, well, he's lame, isn't he? He's a beggar because he's got a duff leg. Yeah. You can draw that from the numbers. Yeah. You see what I mean? Whereas when you're composing something from words, it becomes... It's not impossible, and I'm not saying that it, it's not a good thing once it's done, but it, it, quite, it can be quite challenging. It seems yeah. easy on paper. But I don't think it is, because it's very counter to what your gamer brain has been conditioned to for the last 30 years, which is numbers, yeah. and drawing from the numbers a personality. I think what we've, con what we've said in the past about HeroQuest is it's great in practice. It's just getting your head around the theory, isn't it? Yes, I think that's it. Once you, you know, when we played at Expo, I, I looked at that character she had, and I thought, yeah, that, that character just came alive, and it was really, really good. But I think it's difficult to get to that stage. It's, it's quite a challenge, I think, to get to that stage right. of, of it working. Right. Let's go back to... Uh, it's not a table. We don't have it's tables. It's not a table. No. It's not a table. There's no I'm, dice. There's not, well, I'm going to roll these dice. I've got these special dice. They've got pluses, minuses. <laughs> oh, great. Pluses, minuses and blanks. Okay. Yes. So we need to read them like tea leaves okay. when we roll them. So there we go. We've got... Uh, uh, two minuses, two pluses, and um, blank ones. So that's a zero. What were you? What were the number you were thinking? Uh, minus one. Minus one. I was thinking of plus two, which means that I'm two raises above you. So once well, again, you're not on the dash, you know. What you've got two pluses, two yeah, that's minuses. A, that's, that's a zero. But I was, zero. I was, I was I went minus that, one. So the dice have, have I've got the I've got. Better, I think there's a, better than the score. Target number's minus one for me. The target number for you is plus two. I have one. Yeah, I'll let you have it. There you go. So, so what are you talking about then? Fate, by any chance. <laughs> fate? Who would have thought it? A twist of fate. It was our destiny. It's our fate. <laughs> destiny to talk about fate. Hmm. Someone will write in now and say, that's not how you play fate. What are you talking about? You had five dice for his kickoff. You only have four. Never mind. <laughs> In my version, there's an extra one. In your version, <laughs> yeah, because it's yeah, that's it. Because we're we're not being uh, we're mavericks. We're mavericks. And we're honest. <laughs> I'm a I'm a big fan of fate. I like fate uh, a lot. What's good about fate? Why do you like it a lot? Well, I like it in terms of I like it because it's a sim it's a simple game. People complain that the rule book, fate core rule book, is hard to understand. I think it is hard to understand because one of the things it suffers from is an unfortunate turn of phrase where it talks about aspects and all the time and boosts and things that when you strip it down is no different from a normal role-playing game. I don't think it's hugely yeah. different. It sounds very different, but it's not. 
there's very little to it as a system, but what there is is what counts. Yeah. So the skill set's quite simple. Um, the way it works is it's a very simple kind of system where you know you're just rolling on a on a kind of ladder, aren't you? You've game plus two, plus three, or whatever, yeah. and it has a pause rolls in it as well. A bit like Hero Quest, it, 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 it uses fra- words and phrases as aspects. So you've got skills, which are just pluses. So you might have, you know, fighting plus three, something like that. But it's also got a con- your character has a concept, and it has uh, a problem as well as a trouble, which is quite a good, it's a neat idea. Yeah, so a lot of these. Uh, and it's got three three aspects as well, which are, are all words, just sentences and phrases that sum up your character, and those using fate points can be brought into play. So again, what it does, if you're adapting something, and you're adapting fictional characters. It works very well because it's kind of stripped down, so you don't have to worry too much again about evaluate treasure. Yeah. So, for a good a good example is I played a game of um, Blake Seven Traveler at Grogme yeah. a couple of years ago. And I enjoyed that a lot, but afterwards I thought, do you know what? The best system to do Blake Seven would be Fate, because when you use Traveler, you sit there and you think, as has, he, has he Avon got admin too? Has he really? Where, where, where in the where in the TV show did he ever show an administrative skill? But then at the same time, it was necessary because of the game we were playing. You know, those kind of yeah. skills kicked in. So it's that odd thing of I'm adapting a world, but the game system has things in it that somehow don't fit. I think you'll find that on episode three. You <laughs> managed to. <laughs> there will be so yeah. Someone yeah. they're writing in now, aren't they? <laughs> The, the know, liberator, as we speak. Well, the liberator an has to... problem. <laughs> difficult paperwork on <laughs> Xenon Nine, <laughs> where Servalon was defeated. <laughs> yeah, I, Fate is probably the first system that I encountered that was this mm. conceptual. I think it, I think all that Fate is is a resolution mechanic, just one resolution mechanic that's consistent throughout, yeah. with some bells and whistles attached. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So similar to uh, Hero Quest, it just has a way of dealing, sorting stuff out, doesn't it? As we're sorting stuff out, but again, similar to Hero Quest, not not quite as in, it's not quite as intense. There's like a sliding scale here. Of Hero Quest is lots and lots of words and a few numbers. Yeah. Fate is fifty percent words, fifty percent numbers. Yeah. And what I like about it, and again, it suffers from that problem of finding the right aspect, finding the right way of phrasing something where you think. Okay, I've got an idea what this character is, but I have to come up with these three or four phrases that describe them. What getting the right ones? It's, I don't think the pro, I don't think it's quite as tricky as Hero Quest, but it's on that same continuum, if you like. What I think about Fate and its application thus far that I've experienced mm-hmm. and plays the thing, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that it seems superficial? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that some of the settings. Um, we've mentioned before yeah a superficial yes I agree and it seems like it'd be good for a one shot and it'd be good for the novelty value I did a, a Jerry Cornelius game didn't I uh, and that was all good fun and it lent itself to that style didn't it yeah it was like cartoony a bit it was more based on the final programme film than perhaps on the novels mm. it can deal with that sense of ridiculousness well but I think there's always a problem with the settings and the rules, the mechanics, mm. in that can the novelty last? The come up with ideas mm. like, yeah. I don't know, Buffy the Vampire in Trumpson. Yeah, yes, yeah, you know? yeah, I agree. I, I think they, they, they don't do much for me at all, those kind of things. Cause yeah. I think... But that, that's what these, these kind of rule systems support, don't yes. they? Those kind yeah. of madcap, Cthulhu... In uh, Downton Abbey. Yeah. I suppose it's, be- it's because of that, isn't it? Because they are good. As I've just said, because cause when I'd finished that Blake 7 game, and we've talked about doing a Robin Sherwood game as well, haven't we? Using f- Fate seems perfectly suited to something like that. Yeah. You know, if you wanted to do, for example, if you wanted to do the professionals RPG. And who wouldn't? And who wouldn't? <laughs> I put it down. And why has it not been thought of before? Yeah. <laughs> um, if you did, though, 
Bodie and Doyle as fate characters. It's the perfect system, isn't it? Because yeah. the aspects of these kind of characters, you just find in four or three or four or five phrases to, to describe those characters. Would be fun. Would it be fun to? I'm thinking of them. Yeah, you're thinking of them now, aren't you? <laughs> and I think that's that's what's so good about fate. It's, it's good in terms of you wanted to adapt. If you wanted to adapt a TV show uh, or a comic book or something into a one shot, it, I think it's the perfect game for it. But I agree with you. It, it, it the longevity of it, and I think it'd be interesting this year because I bought the Acton Cthulhu for fate. Um, and again, it's right. You're right. It's that thing, isn't it? Oh, fate, Cthulhu in the Second World War, yeah. and it'd be interesting to see how much mileage we get out of that, you know, or whether after a few games we think, oh, the novelty's worn off. Yeah. I don't think it will, because I think Act on Cthulhu for fate. Cthulhu for fate works very well. The monsters and the spells in it. It it has a sense of. The monsters feel monstrous because they're not particularly pinned down by too many statistics. Yeah. So they have kind of these monstrous aspects that are quite colourful that as a games master you can bring into play. So it's not like uh, basic role-playing Cthulhu where everything's percentages and dice. It becomes a bit more narrative and a bit more kind of well, perhaps picturesque. We'll come, perhaps so, we'll come back and test that when we yeah, play it. Yeah, yeah. But I agree with you. It... it it's the perfect game system to adapt TV show. So let's um, let's return to the table. That we haven't got a table. No. You see, our reliance and dependency on tables shows an absence of imagination, doesn't it? Uh, it does, yeah. Yeah. I like a nice table. Though. I do too. There's something. Yeah. Leave us in that tables alone. <laughs> something reassuring <laughs> about it. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Uh, <laughs> Let's roll this single d6, and no. the target oh. is uh, is three. And uh, I've rolled a one. Okay. But I'm going to spend here. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Spend to uh, increase this up because this is Gumshoe, Pilgrim Press, rule system that we've played in the form of Knights Black Agents. Yes. And it's applied in Esoteris and. Um, Trail of Cthulhu and other systems. And I only include it here really because one of the Grog Squad, um, Steve Ray, mm -hmm. has used Gumshoe to adapt Judge Dread. Yeah. yeah. And using elements of Knights Black Agents to, to grok together Judge Dread. And I can see how that would work. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you could see. Yeah, you, you can kind of adapt it for something like Judge Dread, because Knights Black Agents kind of, not it's kind of espionage, but it's sort of like crime fighting, isn't it? In a way, yeah, it involves chases, it involves shootouts, it involves things blowing up. So, so a key element of Gumshoe is that idea of moving from scene to scene. The triggers are provided by the games master yeah. where you yeah. need to go next, and for something procedural like. Just dread. You can see how it would work. Wouldn't you? Mm. you could do the professionals. You could do the professionals. We're better with fair, but you could do it with gumshoe. Yeah. Wouldn't seem right doing it with hero quest. The thing I'd, I'd think, because I, I tried to approach the Strontium Dog project with gumshoe, but mm. it seemed like I'd have to do a lot of work because it's got skills, hasn't it, and abilities mm. that you would need to translate. And that's what I. That's what I was saying before, as I was saying earlier, that that's one of the problems. The more skills and the more sort of, if you like, hard fix things a game has, the harder it is to adapt because you've got to explain away, either get rid of, explain away, or convert skills and hard stuff on your character sheet, for want of a better term, yeah. into that world, you know. That's that's one of the difficulties. The more skills you've got, and Gumshoe's got lots of stuff, hasn't it? It's like Knights Black Agents. It's got lots and lots of things on there, yeah. which work in Knights Black Agents. But you'd have to look at each one and go, mm, right? Does that fit? Yeah. Does, do I get rid of it? Do I adapt it? Do I leave it as it is? So human terrain probably fits with um, Strontium Dog because you know you want to be yeah, 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 understanding the city when you come into it. Mm. 
uh, if you're on the pursuit of a muti, yeah, uh, probably fits. Would it fit with? Um, would it fit some archaeology? Archaeology ain't going to come up much in a strontium dog game. No, and exact and do. So your instinct is to get rid of it, um, but if you get rid of too many skills, are you then trimming the skill set down too much? So do you replace it with something else? Yeah. Something new. I don't know. That's that's the that's the tricky thing. I think. Yeah. You know that's the tricky the tricky thing with that kind of system. It's yeah. it's asking you to fill in. It's asking you to fill in lots of boxes that you feel like writing. Not applicable. It's yeah. not like filling in a survey. It's a bit too long. So this is not applicable. But then it always begs the question: If so much of it's not applicable, why are you, why are you using this system to adapt it? Why not use something else? The just the just dread game looks tremendous fun, and you can read the exploits of that. Mm. Uh, they're doing it online, and I'll put the link in the show notes yeah. to the. I think I think it would work. Report. I think it would work for Judge Dread. It work for like crime fighty stuff. You know, because yeah. you can take Knights Black Agents and develop. That's what that. it's designed to do. Because that's it? what it's designed to do, and it yeah. does it very well. So you could, yeah, you could do a, a crime for anything crime fighting. Even just remove the vampires, wouldn't you? You know, and it would work. But I think it probably has limit limitations, and it it is for that reason. It's that reason of having to shoehorn things in or shoehorn things out. Right. Well, I've had enough of dice. So what I'm going to do now. <laughs> is I'm going to draw a card. All oh, right, okay. And I've drawn a Joker. Oh well, I've drawn a I've drawn a Jack of Diamonds. Does a Joker be a Joker? And I, I can choose whether to go first or yeah, second. Yeah. Well, do you want to choose a, the the system? It's got to be uh, Savage Worlds. Savage Worlds. <laughs> of course it has. No, I have one. I want to talk about that. Talk about something else. The be- the beauty of this is that we. We don't have to contrive the artifice that it's apparently at random. Yeah, because it's not. It's all negotiated. It? <laughs> it's all negotiated. That's, that's the way. That's the modern way. It's the modern way. These, are, these, yeah. these things are done. Yeah, I'd like to negotiate. I'm 20th level. I don't know, with loads of gold and a castle. Can I? Yeah, you, yeah, can. you can. There you go. Doesn't seem as much fun, does it? Yeah. <laughs> or you say, yes, but... But you, you have a yeah. boil on your ass. That means <laughs> you, can't your ass, you, you can't sit on the throne <laughs> made out of the gold. You've just negotiated out to the games master. Aha! Yes, but. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Savage Worlds. Yeah. Savage Worlds. So, Savage Worlds um, it has a number of different settings. I think predominantly it's known for the Deadlands setting, isn't it? Yeah, that's where it originates from. I think. Yeah, yeah, which is a um, a Western yeah. supernatural setting, from what, from what I can gather. Yeah, again, it, it's kind of that the fate going down the fate road, aren't you? The, the yeah. <laughs> kind of slightly off beam settings that you think, oh, all right. And its associations with Westerns is probably the reason why I've fallen on this one. To do the strontium dog thing. Yes, yeah, and that's where that's where the cards come from, isn't it? Because I yeah. think if it was a Western game, drawing cards for initiative. Yeah. So rather than roll a dice, you draw cards every um, every round, don't you? Yeah. Which when we've played it, I, I quite like that because yeah. I like that idea that every round. I know you could do it with the dice, but a lot of games initiative sort of fixed, isn't it? So yeah. you either roll initiative at the beginning of the fight, or it's fixed, it's just the same every time. Uh, and every round it's the same, whereas with Savage World you draw the cards. But I think the cards as well give it a bit of physicality, doesn't it? <laughs> physicality. 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 Uh, that, yes. That's yeah, enjoyable, yeah. you know, everybody draws a card. Yeah, and, and every it. round it's good because you think, oh, well, I'm, you know, I went last, I had a really duff card last time, but this time I might, you might, you know. See, what I think this system does as a generic system for adapting generic stuff is that it gives you best of both Savage Worlds mm-hmm. yeah. in that you've got elements of so character design is fairly familiar isn't it because it follows a similar yeah it's, it's familiar it, again it's num- it's numbers it's again numbers. on the sliding scale we've, got, dice, we've gone now to the one which is is more numbers, numbers. than anything numbers and, and, you, dice, and yeah. you do have skills but the skills are quite broad brush yes. so yeah. they're not as specific as they are in Gumshoe for example yeah. so you know you've you got things that you can apply 
And it also takes that element that is apparent in Fates and in um, Hero Quest, in that you use words to describe your edge, so what makes yeah. you good, and you also have a hindrance. Yeah. And what I find good with uh, the Strong Young Dog um, adaptation, creating the characters, is I've been using the tables from the Traveller uh, supplement that came out with Mongoose and adapting them into edges and hindrances mm. for the mutations. Yeah. And it's worked really well. Yeah. So the tables are giving my imagination a prompt and the um, the looseness of having the words has allowed me to create the mutations into something interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Really? So I think Savage World strikes a good balance for us older gamers who are used to having the props. Yeah, of the I think of the four games we've mentioned, it's certainly the most familiar. Yeah. When I, when I read the rules to Savage Worlds, um, I thought, yeah, all right, uh, this. Yeah. This is quite e- rel- relatively easy to get my head around and understand. So com- conflict is blow by blow, isn't it? So yeah. it's not yeah. it's not a single. No, no, it's it's an old school roll to hit, but it's scalable. Yeah. You know, so you can do group battles in the same, using the same mechanics, yeah. depending on your leadership or how you apply those. So it does have that flexibility that's apparent in some of the other games, but mm. with some more, for the want of a better word, crunch to it. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have to see how it plays out, because we've played it a couple of times with uh, Daily Dwarf, but... It'd be good to see how that plays out and compare it to Fate over this year, won't we? Yeah, we'll get a chance to do that. Yeah, but uh, but no, it's a it's a nice it's a nice system. I think the other thing that's worth commenting on at this point, with all the systems we've talked about, is all very affordable. Yes, you know you you get a lot of games these days, and the rule books cost you God knows what. Um, Savage Worlds ten was it ten ninety nine for the yeah. rules. Fair, I think I paid about a ten of fair rules. Fair to accelerate it is a fiver. Yeah. And Hero Quest, it's not hugely expensive as a system, is it? No. You know, no. on here, I, I, have, I have to say, Hero Quest Grolantha is is great value for money because you get a game and you also get loads of because because the game is simple and as you say, it just gives you a resolution mechanic. The Hero Galantha rules, rule book, you get loads of information about Galantha. Yeah. So some of the systems that we haven't touched on, because we haven't played them, mm-hmm. and I think they're worth investigating. You talk about affordability, one of the things that pops me off, something like Genesis, for mm-hmm. example. Yeah. Genesis is a generic system, but you need to have all those special dice, don't you, that? Uh, yeah, that's always... Uh, I mean, I, I know you have to special dice for fair, but they're not... They're not particularly expensive yeah but I know yeah there's a, there's a limit with the special dice isn't there where you start thinking I'm not so sure about this now that is like reading tea leaves when you roll yeah, the dice yeah. and the, oh, the yellow one counteracts that one and if you do that one that means that's explored and really sometimes it just comes down to I've not played it yeah. but my, my interpretation of it is is it no different than that recommendation in Toon where it says roll a d6 if it's uh, between uh, 1 and 3 it's yes if it's <laughs> well I think one, the pro- six, one of the problems no. with, one of the problems with the funny the, the funny dice thing with symbols and stuff and f- this is a problem with fair um, again your gamer brain gets a bit bamboozled by it so it's like the fair dice you've got four dice with each dice is, you say two, two minuses two pluses two blanks and you roll four of them so in, in theory you could get a four as in four pluses you could get minus four and everything in between and when you put in together a fair game you start thinking well hang on a minute what's the probability of getting a minus what's the oh you know you can work it out but y- your brain's a bit you know yeah. you see what I mean it's not like rolling a d20 and saying Okay, you need a ten or more, and you've got a plus two on the roll. Your gamer brain can process that very, very easily because you're so familiar, so familiar with yeah. second nature. And and the Genesis is like that. Star Wars, the well, Star Wars games are like that. You get yeah. the funny dice with the symbols that counteract. It's the same dice. Yeah, it, there's a bit of you. I remember Eddie showing us, and your gamer brain thinks. So what are my chances of doing this thing? Yeah. 
And as a games master, you'd think, how challenging is this, given that they can roll dice, but there's a chance one dice will like cancel out another dice. Yeah. The uh, other system, of course, that we need to name check is GURPS. Now, GURPS... Yeah, yeah. Very popular, isn't it? Very GURPS? popular, which is more of a toolkit approach, isn't it? So mm. you get loads of components that you build together to create the generic setting that you want it to be in. Mm. Yeah. But that seems like bloody hard work for me, that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's one of the things. It becomes hard work, doesn't it? Yeah. Kind of world, world building and all that. I think as well, it's probably worth saying that one of the tricky things about the systems we've just been talking about, those kind of generic systems, uh, Fate and, and Savage Worlds in particular, is that at times they can, when you're reading the rules, feel a bit bland because something's missing and what's missing is the setting yeah the set and that's the thing with the game isn't it sometimes the setting and the system are intertwined yeah. and the setting can fire fire up your imagination uh, and the system can almost be a secondary thing whereas when you read a, a, a settingless generic system they decide sometimes it can just feel a bit it's like a bag of salt of ready salted crisps in it when really you wanted prawn cocktail. Yeah. Just feels sometimes feels a little bit you know, a bit more salt, please. <laughs> it needs something else. Yeah. You know. I've certainly felt I felt on a red fate, I like the fate system. But because there's no setting with it, you're just thinking, I I need a bit it'd be, be better if it was a setting. It might just feel a bit more wholesome, a bit more whole. Don't know. Maybe that's just me. Well, I'm going back to the drawing board with my Cthulhu in Trumpton idea with Windy Miller eating prawn cocktail crisps. <laughs> but they're not prawn cocktail. They're not prawn cocktail. No. In my go. My go flavour. Yes, yeah. of course. They are. <laughs> Grog meat was fantastic in 2018, and after consultation with the attendees, we decided to do it again in 2019. Check out thegrognardfiles.com for more details. We're also planning a virtual grog meet of online games on the 12th and 13th of April. Thank you to Ian for being such a generous guest. He's a great games master. And if you get a chance to play one of his games at a games convention, then take the opportunity. You won't regret it. If you'd like a copy of HeroQuest Galantha, generously provided by bonhomiegames.uk, then please take part in our competition. Send us a photograph of the best thing that you've made for a game. A handout, character sheet, model, Lego diorama or a mini. Or whatever. It's a chance to show off the physical innovations that you've come up with to enhance your game. Tweet them, Facebook them, me we them. Or email them to dirtthedice at gmail.com making sure that you copy us in before the end of February 2019. Joe and Chris from Bonhomie We'll pick the favourite and we'll showcase the best on thegrognardfiles.com. Check out the site for more details. At the moment, I'm still working hard on putting together the next grogzine. I'm still waiting for some bits and pieces, so it might be released a little later than build, but it'll be worth the wait. I've recently taken delivery of the cover from Russ Nicholson, and it's wonderful. Possibly my favourite of the work that he's done for us. The grogzine is a free hard copy fanzine that we produce for Patreons as a thank you. The Patreon funds have really helped us in 2018 and to fund some new equipment and to cover the costs of running the grog pod. It's also an incentive. Knowing that people have generously donated keeps us busking along with this bobbins. With the upcoming release of the grog zine, there have been some more people joining the Patreon in November and December 2018, so here's our heartfelt thanks to them. Joining us at $1 a month, thanks to Stephen Eyre, Adrian Bigland, Sean Suter, Chris Stram, Paul Fricker and Jeremy Davis. Welcome. At the $3.5 level, we have Patrick Kraps. Thank you. For $5 a month level, I'd like to roll on a table and give them a gift relevant to the subject under discussion. This time, we're back in Glorantha. Let's look back at the plunder supplement and the wonderful tables of treasure. Okay, Michael de Plata, you get 
209 clacks and 8 wheels. Don't spend it all at once. Mark, did you know you get the Crystal Goblet of Sky? Arms, you get a fire stick. Jason Connolly, you get Garsman's Girdle for 18 hours only. Alistair Davidson, you get a green snake skull. Andrew Holt, you get Mazu's tooth. And uh, Carl Clare, Morikan's thumbs. There you go. And finally, Michael Watson, you get the saddle of one two. Thanks to you all. Enjoy your plunder. Increasing his treasure factor to seven and a half dollars a month is Nick Edwards, who's also written a great piece for the Grogzine about the Judges Guild. Nick, you get the horns of the great brew. And there's nothing like a great brew. Finally, Fraser Jackson has joined it. $10 a month level. Thanks, Fraser. You'll get a certificate with your zine so you can see your virtual prize forever. And it's Storm Bull's ear. Thanks for all your support. We're pleased that the Grog Pod was voted number two in EN World's Top of the Pods 2018. Well, it's not the first time we've been described it as a number two. Next time, we'll return to reminiscing about the 1980s Nothing is forgotten. Nothing is ever forgotten. Adios, amigos.